So we will finish with uh, where we left off last week and then we'll continue with the first occurrence of the tithe. Last week, what did we say about the first occurrence of words, utterances, and uh, phrases, sentences, and all that? What did we say about the first occurrence of words? Exactly. That we are always giving a guide. Yes? Yes, there is always the guide of the, for, for their interpretation and their understanding from the affairs occurrence yes that is a very a very good uh, bible study tool to use we said that in scripture numbers are never used carelessly for at the back of every usage is immeasurable wisdom perfect design and supernatural intent and in daniel 8:13 we were informed that there is a holy one who either presides or knows something relating to numbers and their secrets. We learned that that holy one was the wonderful numberer. And then we looked at the biblical significance of the number one. And we said that one means unity. In all languages, it is a symbol of unity. Then we said one also means self-sufficiency. Needs no help from any. <laughs> do, you, do you get that? God needs no help from any. And then we said that one also means source or origin. All stand in need of it. All right? Good. And then we said a scripture last week, but we did not even, we did not look at it. But Deuteronomy 6 verse 12 from the King James, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Do you, do you know that song? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all that. You don't know it? Oh, okay. N next week. Next week, we will teach it. Yes? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is. It's a very nice song. It's an old song too. Old one. <laughs> no. <laughs> that shall all that. Okay. All right. So, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It is for this reason why, the, why in Bible study, the first occurrence of words expressions and utterances are generally essential guides to their interpretation and meaning. They are full of significance. Then we looked at the word prophet and we said that the first time the word prophet occurred in scripture, it is used in relation to prayer. And we said prayer means to go between. Yes? To go between. To be a referee. To be a peacemaker to be a judge. So the first time the word prophet is used, it wasn't used in terms of uh, uh, foretelling. It is used in terms of foretelling. It is used in terms of being exposed man. Yes? So this tells us that the Foretelling is actually a minute aspect of the prophetic office. Do you understand that? The second time this word is also used is in Exodus 7, 1. And there it says, and the Lord God said to Moses, and this is also God saying it. The first time, God was the one who used it. And he used it in relation to prayer. Someone who prays. Someone who stands between the gap. The second time God used the word, he used it this way. He said to Moses, he said, Moses, I will make you a God unto Pharaoh. And Aaron shall be a prophet Unto you. 
and this is also God using it. And the way he used it, aren't we supposed to learn something from that? So, the main, the main duty of a prophet is to stand in the gap, is to be a spokesperson. Do you understand that? And the foretelling, the prediction is only a minute aspect of the office. And this comes from the first occurrence of the word. All right? Are we, are we, are we getting it? Okay. So, when you meet the prophet who is only predicting, he's, he's, he's actually operating in the, 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 the lower levels <laughs> of his office. Uh, but we have rather, we have, we've rather turned it upside down. <laughs> All right? Okay. And then we looked at um, the first occurrence of words in Scripture. And the first one we looked at uh, last week was the word judge. And we said that this word judge, the Greek word kritikos, that word kritikos, this is the only place that word is used in the whole of the New Testament. Kritikos. And it's used in relation to what God's word is capable of doing. God's word is skilled in judging. Amen? Amen? God's word is skilled in discriminating and passing judgment on thoughts and feelings. That is what God's word does. Amen? Good. The second thing we want to look at, then we go on to today's... Uh, in fact, th there are so many places where uh, certain words have been used only once in, in Scripture, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Last week, we looked at one in the Old Testament. And we looked at what? From the Old Testament. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Amen? Good, 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 good. Who, who remembers where it's found? The first place Jerusalem is mentioned in scripture. Who remembers? Uncle Kuku, don't say anything. And, and, and please don't say Google. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go on. Okay. The second thing we want to look at is the word perfect. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is where the word is found. Verse 17 says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This is the only place that word is found. Atheos. This is the only place that word is found and it is used in relation with the word of God. And what does that say to you? That the only, the only, <laughs> the only thing that is capable of making the man or the woman of God qualify for every good work is God's word. And it's been emphasized by its using just once. Nowhere else in scripture is Atheos found. There is nowhere. The word perfect means to be qualified. It means to be capable. It means to be competent. So what he's saying is all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for righteousness, listen, it is, listen, that the man or the woman of God may be qualified, that the woman or the man of God may be capable, 
that the woman or the man of God may be competent to perform functions of all good works. The only thing that does that is God's word. That is why this morning, this morning at Sunday school, we were talking about meditating on scripture. Hey, it works. Meditating on scripture. Amen. Good. Now, if it is true that the first occurrence of words, expressions, and utterances are generally essential guides to their interpretation and meaning, what can we learn from the first occurrence of the word tithe? Is it possible that we can learn something from the first occurrence of the word tithe? <laughs> is it possible? Okay. That is why this is a kingdom view of the tithe. Abraham was the first to tithe in scripture. What did I say? Again? I heard some people saying Abraham. And I heard some people saying Abraham. Who was the first person to tithe in scripture? Again? Okay. Why do you think I'm particular about the name? After yeah, his name was changed. Yes. Before his encounter, that's right. Good. <laughs> Good. Good. Abram actually means father of elevation. Now, we're talking about the first person who ties in scripture. Now, the first person who ties in scripture, his name is father of elevation. His name was changed from father of elevation to father of many nations. So, he gave his tithe when he was Abram, father of elevation. It also means father of promotion. <laughs> it also means father of advancement or father of increase. Now, what does this teach us? This was before he tithed. And he was a father of elevation. What does this suggest to us? That can be found in Genesis 14, 20. And, he, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abram, and he, Abram, the father of elevation, gave him a tithe. What does this suggest to us? First lesson of the first usage of the word tithe. Yes. Exactly. He was already blessed. So the first lesson, Abraham was already the father of elevation before he gave a tithe. We are talking about the kingdom view of the tithe. <laughs> before Abraham gave a tithe, he was already promoted. He was already a success. He was already an increase. Now, if you doubt that, let me, let me, let me, let, let me show that to you. But before then, let's look at this. Abraham tithed. I like this. When I wrote this down, I, I, something really happened to my bones. Listen, Abraham tithed because of who he was. Not because of what he wanted to become. Please, you listen to this again. 
Because most times, listening to this just once, you may think you've got it, but uh, very, very soon you forget. Abraham tithed because of who he was. He did not tithe because he wanted to become something else. Jonathan, are you, are you getting it? This is the first usage of the word tithing. The first person who tithed was already a success. If you doubt it, look at what the Bible says in Genesis 13, 14. This was before he tithed, though. Listen, this was before he gave a tithe. The Bible says Abraham was what? Eh? <laughs> uh, are you getting me? Abraham was uh, yes, Abraham. Thank you, Uncle K. <laughs> Abraham was very rich. Now they could have said Abraham was rich, but they said very rich in livestock, in silver. And in gold, the first lesson we learn <laughs> in the first occurrence of the word tithing is that you don't give to be blessed. You give because you are blessed. Am I communicating? The place is a bit too quiet for my liking. <laughs> you are taking it in. Good. Listen, if you give with the view of becoming blessed, you are saying that you are not blessed. Does that make sense? If you give with a view of becoming blessed, you are saying that you are not blessed. What you are magnifying is this. I am not blessed. Now, maybe from this day forward, this statement would answer some of your questions. Why some have paid the tithe and nothing seems to be happening. Because of what you are magnifying during the time you are giving your tithe. What you are magnifying is this. I'm not blessed. <laughs> because by law, you always see what you focus on. Now, tell me this is not true. Those of us who are married, if you choose to see the negatives of your spouse, you will, you will always see the negatives. Anything, listen, if you focus on the negatives, you would see the negatives. If you focus on the positives, you, focus, you would see positives. What you focus on is what you see. So as you are focusing on you are not blessed, you are going to see I'm not blessed. Meanwhile, you are giving your tithe. You are doing it faithfully, but nothing seems to be happening. Why? Because your perspective is wrong. The number two law. By law, what you magnify, you attract. <laughs> Are we taking it in? 
What you magnify, you attract. So although you've given your tithe, all right, you are giving your tithe, and that is the reason why, personally, I have never liked the, the, the type of teaching that, that adds fear to the giving of tithe. Because when you give out of fear, you are attracting fear. And then some would say to you, if you refuse to tithe, God will take it one way or the other. He, can, he, he may take it with, uh, either by a hospital bill or, uh, 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 sorry? <laughs> exactly. A car repairs. Your car gets, gets broken down and it's, oh, because I did not pay my tithe. That is the reason why my car broke down. And the money is not going to God when you pay it to the mechanic. But they, they will say to you, God will take it one way or the other, either by a hospital bill or... So someone is going to give with that perspective in mind. Don't do that. Don't do that. That is not how... <laughs> The kingdom people see tithing. The kingdom person tithes because he or she is blessed. Not because he or she wants to be blessed. That is the first lesson that we have been taught in the first usage of the word tithing. This is the first lesson to master. Because whenever you are ready to tithe, you are always met with two kings. Genesis 14. If you don't know this, and you are met with the two kings that we are going to see, if you don't know that you are already blessed, if you don't know that, then a king will deceive you. Have we, are we getting it so far? What did we say the first lesson is? We give. We give because we are blessed. So whenever you are coming with your tithe, you are coming with this mindset, I am blessed. And because your focus is, I am blessed, you are attracting more of, I am blessed. Because whatever you focus on, that is what you attract. That is the law. Last year, we talked about God works within the confines of law. So this should not confuse any of us. Yes? That is the first lesson. Now, if you don't know this, there is always, always, any time it is, it is time to give the tithe, you are always met with two kings. Before Abraham gave the tithe, he was met with two kings. The first one was the king of Sodom. The second was the king of Salem. He was met with two kings. Let's look at the king of Sodom. Genesis 14, 17 says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. That is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat. So, now, do you see this? He gave the tithe after his victory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I tell you, it ties, it ties. I mean, it's, 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 look, look. The, oh, okay, okay, all right. We'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that later. Sometimes I like to jump. Amen. I should walk. Yes, sir, I will. 
And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. After his return from defeat. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. <laughs> that is the king of Sodom. Anytime you, we are talking about the first, the, the, the first time tithe was paid or was given in scripture. After his victory, he was met by two kings. King of Sodom and King of Salem. King of Sodom said, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. Who is the king of Sodom? Genesis 14, 2 says that they made war with who? The king of And what is the meaning of Bera? Son of evil. And, and you think the name is there for nothing? <laughs> Son of evil. Uh, I have coded this, this, it this way. The wrong way of doing things. Or life after the flesh. So when it is time for you to give a tithe, after you have gained victory, you are met with a king. And the first king is the son of evil. The wrong way of doing things or life after the flesh. You are met with this in mind. <laughs> Genesis 14, 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him. We want to look at this word, meet. The word to meet is to have an encounter with someone. This may be intentional or hostile. Now, we will come back to this word again, and we will go a little bit deeper into the word, okay? Yes? Good. Oh, we are taking notes, that's why we... Is it the weather that is making us... <laughs> okay, all right. I hope, I hope I'm, not, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not making you think too much. All right. It's part of it. Thank you. Jopaf always has uh, an answer to. <laughs> a spokesman. That's right. Spokesperson. That's right. So, Jopaf, you're a prophet, eh? <laughs> he doesn't want the office. <laughs> okay. So, after Abraham's return from the defeat, he had an encounter with a way of thinking which suggested a wrong way of doing things. Before Abraham gave the tithe, he was met with another king. Sorry? Yes, thank you very much. Oh, you are actually, you are, you, you, you are in touch. Well done. Before Abraham gave a tithe, before the father of elevation gave a tithe, he met with a second king, the king of Salem. That is Genesis 14, 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. <laughs> you know, Genesis 14 is just because of time and my focus. That's why I have decided to just, but if you, listen, if you read all the names of the people that came against uh, Abraham, that Abraham went and fought, if you read all their names, it will marvel you. 
<laughs> it will marvel you. Then, so it means we are supposed to learn something more than what we read in Genesis 14, 1 to 20, 20, uh, 27 or 24 or 25. There is more to that scripture. There is more to that passage than meets the eye. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God, most high. And even here, the priest of God. Oh. Sometimes, time, time, time is not, time. anyway, time is good. Time is good. Uh, Hebrews 7, 1 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, I intentionally brought uh, uh, Hebrews 7, 1 because of this word, met. You remember the first one, we, we saw that the king of Sodom met Abraham. And here, in Hebrews 7, 1, we are being told that Melchizedek also met Abraham. In the Hebrew, we only talked about having an encounter. In the Greek, we would see something a bit different. But it is the same word. All right? The name Melchizedek is a compound of two words. And these are Melech or Malki, as it is spelled in some cases, and Tzedek. So Melech and Tzedek. Melchizedek. It's a compound. Word. Melech is from the root word Malak. Wow. Showers of blessings. Melech is from the root word Malak, which primarily means to reign. Tzedek on the other hand, is from the root word meaning the, to be right, to be just, to justify. So literally, Melchizedek means righteousness rules, righteousness reigns, or the king of righteousness. I said two people met Abraham. One was the king of Sodom. Whose name is Bera. And Bera means the son of evil or the wrong way of doing things or to live a life after the flesh. If, if scripture says you are living a life after the flesh, it does not mean you are, you are living a life after your body. <laughs> You are being fleshy. doesn't mean you are being bodily. It means your way of thinking is after the flesh. It's not after the spirit. Do you understand that? So, Malek is from a root word, Malak, which primarily means to reign. Tzedek, on the other hand, is from the root word meaning to be right, to be just, and to justify. So literally, Melchizedek means righteousness rules, righteousness reigns, or the king of righteousness. Melchizedek represents the right way of doing things. <laughs> or life after the spirit. So whenever you are ready to give your tithe, you are always met by two people. Two ways of thinking. Two attitudes always come to mind. 
should I take the goods for myself or I should do the right thing? These are the two ways of thinking every time. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you getting me? We are talking about our title. So far, we've not talked about uh, Malachi 3.10. What does Malachi 3.10 say? <laughs> what does he say? Will a man... Yes, and yet you have robbed me. Huh? Tithe and offerings. Bring, you, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse of the Lord. So there will be... He says, you are cursed with a curse. Hey! Anyway, I've taught that before. If you go on the YouTube, I taught this when we were at um, St. John's. If you remember, I talked about the, the it's, it's there, it's there on YouTube. And I explained what that verse actually means. You are cursed with a curse. That is not what the scripture said. Go and do a research. But anyway, it's on YouTube. <laughs> go and find it. Melchizedek represents the right way of doing things or life after the spirit. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, he says, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him? The word to meet the Greek is sunantao. And this word means to meet someone from an opposite direction one, for fellowship and impartation of knowledge. Whenever this word is used in the Greek, it is always used for two reasons. One, fellowship. Two, there is impartation of knowledge. The other time this word is used was in Acts, when Colinius prayed and God said to uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Peter, to go and meet with, the Bible says, as Peter was getting to the house, Cornelius went to meet him. So he met him from an opposite direction. And they had fellowship. And after the fellowship, Peter now imparted the knowledge of what God wanted him to share with Cornelius. So when Abram and Melchizedek met. That was the reason why the Bible says Melchizedek brought what? Bread and wine. One for fellowship. And after fellowship, there was the impartation of the knowledge of the tithe. So Abraham did not give the tithe out of ignorance. He gave the tithe because Melchizedek taught him what the tithe represents. That was the reason why after Melchizedek did what he did, the Bible says, and Abraham gave a tithe of all. Because of this word, to meet. If you just read it from in the English, you will brush through it and just go. But if you dig a little bit, it will help you. Sinantao. Yes? Are we following? So after Abraham's return from the defeat, he had another encounter with a way of thinking which suggested the right way of doing things. You always have this too. Should I or should I not? Should I do the right thing or I should keep the goods for myself. Genesis 14, 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Sodom, brought out what? Bread and wine. He was the priest of the most high God. Then 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him 
a tithe of all. So, we've learned a few things today. The first occurrence of the word tithe was the first lesson. You give because you are blessed. You don't give because Abraham, Abraham gave because of who he was. Abraham did not give because of what he wanted to become. The Bible says he was already rich. He was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. This was before he gave the tithe. Are you getting me? Whatever you focus on, that is what you will see. So when you are giving your tithe, what do you focus on? I'm blessed. You are magnifying I'm blessed. And because you are magnifying I'm blessed, by law, you will attract blessings. The second thing, but from the first use of of the word tithe. What do we see? We see, yes, yes, we see fellowship. That's right. Encounter with two kings. Or two ways of doing things. Or two attitudes. And what's the first one? The wrong way of doing things. And what, what would the wrong way of doing things say to you? What did the king of Bera say? To, what did the king of Sodom say to Abraham, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. <laughs> and what did the king of Salem, Melchizedek, say to Abraham? He blessed him and he taught him what the principle of the tithe really means. So now listen, tithing <laughs> is not so called because it is an Old Testament principle. It is not an Old Testament principle. Are you getting me? Why did I say it's not an Old Testament principle? Some people say because tithe, the, the word tithe, because it's found in the Old Testament, it is an Old Testament principle. But I taught here last year that the titles Old Testament and New Testament are only used for reference purposes. It is not inspired of God. The only thing old <laughs> in Genesis to Malachi is the killing of animals to shed uh, uh, to shed the blood of goats and, and bulls. That is the only thing that is old because the new came to ratify the old. But to read, that is why the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, is profitable for uh, 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 whatever. <laughs> but it's profitable. So a scripture taken from Deuteronomy does not make it old. It is scripture. I, I, am, I, am I communicating with us? Yeah. <laughs> so tithing is not an Old Testament principle. It is scripture. So, whenever you come to tithe, you are always met with two attitudes. The king of Bera and the king of Salem. The king of Sodom and the king of Salem. You are met with, you are met with Bera, the son of evil. You are always met with Melchizedek. Righteousness reigns. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, the right way of doing things reigns. There is so much I wish I could share on Melchizedek. I wish I could do that. 
another time. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. When you know who you are, when you know why you are giving the tithe, when the king of Sodom, when Berah, when the son of evil, when the way of thinking of doing something wrong occurs to you, you will say, I have already raised my hand to the Lord God most high. Because you know why you are doing it. Next week, we would go into what a tithe actually means and we'll look at the spiritual significance of the number 10. We'll look at the design in scripture. And then, maybe the following week, we'll talk about who benefits when you tithe. <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about all that, yes? And then we'll also talk about, do we pay gross or net. <laughs> we'll talk about all that. Now listen, Melchizedek blessed Abraham and blessed God. And Abraham gave him a tithe of all. Listen to this. When a person realizes that his or her victories are gained by the power of God alone, he willingly uses a tenth of his increase of power, understanding a substance for the furtherance of the truth. When a person realizes that his or her victories are gained by the power of God, God alone, he willingly uses a tenth. The tenth represents his all. <laughs> he willingly uses a tenth of his increase of power, understanding, and substance for the furtherance of the truth. And that was what Auntie Jane was saying to us today in Sunday school. Deuteronomy 8, 11 says, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and, and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that testy and, whistle and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and my strength, sorry, my power and the strength of my hand have produced this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord, your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Stay blessed.